Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Paul C. Lucas. I'm one of your instructors in cardiology. Most of the slides in this lecture will be uh, mostly pictures and sound recordings. So please enjoy the lecture. Today, I will be discussing with you cardiovascular physical examination. A complete medical history and physical examination will give you 60 to 80% of the diagnosis, and the rest is by diagnostic investigation. It is important to give emphasis to these two parameters because you will use it in your everyday life as a physician. Physical examination starts with general survey. This includes the general appearance, the age, posture, demeanor, and overall health status of your patient. An example to this is when the patient comes in to your clinic and on the emergency room, you will already identify abnormalities based just by looking at the patient physically. During the interview, you have to identify symptoms which may be related to cardiovascular diseases. This will give you clues on what cardiovascular disease are you dealing with. Example is, is the patient in pain or resting quietly, the patient dyslexic or diaphoretic? You also have to identify movements of your patient during the history or physical examination. Does the patient choose to avoid certain body positions to reduce or eliminate the pain? An example to this is on the next slide. Pericarditis is the inflammation of the pericardium. This is the fibrous shock surrounds the heart. It is classified by a sharp chest pain, which is relieved by body positions like sitting up or leaning forward. However, it is aggravated by lying down. Other clinical signs that may give you clues to cardiovascular diseases are the following. Pallor, cyanosis, or jaundice. This picture shows you a chronically ill appearing emaciated patient, which may suggest a long-standing heart failure, or could be a sign of another systemic disorder, which is malignancy. Various genetic syndromes often has cardiovascular involvement. That's why you have to be vigilant and uh, very thorough in doing the cardiovascular PE of these patients with the following syndrome, trisomy 21, old forum syndrome, and Marfan syndrome. There are other syndromes that will be discussed later in the cardiovascular diseases. Computing for the body mass index is a very important part of cardiovascular physical examination because abnormality, either overweight, underweight, obese, will give you a strong risk factor to the development of cardiovascular diseases such as coronary artery disease, hypertension, and diabetes mellitus. An additional 
solution to your BMI is the measurement of the waist to hip ratio. This can also be a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. An example would be your metabolic syndrome. We will now go through the different systems and identify signs for cardiovascular diseases. For the skin, central cyanosis occurs with significant right to left shunting at the level of the heart or lungs, allowing deoxygenated blood to reach the systemic circulation. While peripheral cyanosis or acrocyanosis is usually related to reduced extremity blood flow due to small vessel constriction. This may be seen in patients with severe heart failure, those in shock or peripheral vascular disease. This can be aggravated by the use of your beta blockers with an opposed alpha-mediated constriction. Now you know about the difference between central and peripheral cyanosis. What about differential cyanosis? This refers to isolated cyanosis affecting the lower but not the upper extremities in a patient with a large patent ductus arteriosus and secondary pulmonary hypertension with the right to left to shunting at the great vessel level. You may also appreciate different types of telangiectasia. We have hereditary types, which may be seen on the lips, tongue, and mucous membrane, which may be a part of osler weber Rendu syndrome or your hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. What about malar telangiectasia? This can be seen in patients who have severe mitral stenosis in rheumatic heart disease and scleroderma. Hemochromatosis. This is an hereditary iron overload and may cause restrictive cardiomyopathy. It can be seen an unusually tan or bronze discoloration of the skin. Jaundice, which may be visible first in the sclera and it has a broad differential diagnosis. However, in the appropriate setting, since we're talking about cardiovascular disease, then it can be consistent with advanced right-sided heart failure and congestive hepatomegaly or late-term cardiac cirrhosis. Cutaneous ecchymosis. So these are red discolored spots that are more than 10 millimeters in diameter. Unlike your petechiae, which is 3 millimeters, or a purpura, which is 3 to 10 millimeters. So these cutaneous ecchymoses are seen in patients who are taking vitamin K antagonists like your warfarin, or those who are taking antiplatelets like aspirin and clopidogrel. You may also find skin abnormalities in various lipid disorders. An example would be your subcutaneous anthomas, which can be found particularly along the tendon sheets or over the extensor surfaces of the extremities. In severe hypertriglyceridemia, you can see eruptive xanthomatosis and, lipid and lipemia retinalis. In palmar crease which are specific for type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia, 
And last thing would be your pseudosanthoma elastic group, which is a disease associated with premature atherosclerosis. This can be seen as leathery cobblestone appearance of the skin in the axilla and neck recess and by angioid streaks. Dentition and oral hygiene should be assessed in every patient, both as a source of potential infection and as an index of general health. An example to this is infective endocarditis, especially in patients who have valvular heart diseases or those who underwent prosthetic valve replacement. A high arch alloc is a feature of Marfan syndrome and other connective tissue disease syndromes. A bifid uvula has been described in patients with lois jet syndrome. lois jet syndrome is like Marfan syndrome or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. This presents with aneurysm of the aorta. However, it also occurs in other arteries of the body and it usually occurs in young patients. So if you do not identify this Loisbett syndrome during childhood, patients may die early. This is also what we call aortic aneurysm syndrome. Many patients with congenital heart disease have associated hypertellurism. Hypertellurism is the wide distance between the two eyes. Some would have no set of ears or micrognathia. Micrognathia is what we also know as mandibular hypoplasia, where there is a small lower jaw. Blue sclera are a feature of osteogenesis imperfecta. So osteogenesis imperfecta is a connective tissue disease. It has the capacity to have heart failure, or patients may develop atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, and they have the predilection also to develop valvular valvulopathies. As we always tell you, whenever you do the physical examination, a fundoscopic examination should be performed routinely in the assessment of patients with suspected endocarditis and those with a history of acute visual change. In patients who have hypertensive retinopathy, which usually occurs late, usually you find arteriolar thickening and leaking, or you can see arteriolar narrowing. You may also find this in patients with diabetic retinopathy. For the chest, a midline sternotomy, a left posterolateral thoracotomy, or intraclavicular scars at the site of a pacemaker or defibrillator generator implantation should not be overlooked and may provide the first clue regarding an underlying cardiovascular disorder in patients unable to provide a relevant history. So these are patients who underwent cabbage or coron coronary artery bypass grafting or those who underwent uh, valvular replacements or for patients who, were, who underwent ICD implantation or pacemaker insertion. A prominent venous collateral pattern may suggest subclavian or vena cava obstruction. If the head and neck appear dusky and slightly cyanotic, and the venous pressure is grossly elevated without visible pulsations, a diagnosis of superior vena cava syndrome should be entertained. So these patients are, are characterized by edema of the upper extremities, from the chest also up to the head part.
Thoracic age abnormalities have been well described among patients with connective tissue disease like your Marfan syndrome. They include pectus carinatum or your pigeon chest and pectus excavatum or final chest. Obstructive lung disease is suggested by a barrel chest deformity, especially with tachypnea, first lip breathing, and use of accessory muscles. So this can be seen in patients who have COPD or those who have chronic bronchitis or emphysema. Ankylosing spondylitis is characterized by severe kyphosis and compensatory lumbar, pelvic, and knee flexion. This should prompt you by careful examination or auscultation of a murmur of aortic regurgitation. Straight back syndrome refers to the loss of the normal kyphosis of the thoracic spine and has been described in patients with mitral valve prolapse and its variants. The respiratory rate and pattern should be noted during spontaneous breathing with attention to death, audible wheezing, and stridor. Lung examination can reveal adventitious sounds indicative of pulmonary edema like coarse crackles, pneumonia, or pleuritis. When doing abdominal exam, again, you will have clues for cardiovascular diseases. The liver is frequently enlarged and tender in patients with chronic heart failure. Systolic pulsations over the liver signify severe tricuspid regurgitation. What about splenomegaly? This may occur or may be a feature of infective uh, endocarditis, particularly when symptoms have persisted for weeks or months. You may even palpate the spleen uh, at about 2 centimeters below the left costal margin. Ascites is a non-specific finding that may be present with advanced chronic right heart failure or constrictive pericarditis. In non-obese patients, the aorta typically is palpated between the epigastrium and the umbilicus. The sensitivity of palpation for the detection of an abdominal aortic aneurysm that is a pulsatile and expansile mass decreases as a function of body size. Because palpation alone is not sufficiently and accurate to establish the diagnosis of an aortic aneurysm, so you need further studies or you need an ultrasound to, to, to confirm the diagnosis. Now, the presence of an arterial brewing over the abdomen suggests high-grade atherosclerotic disease, although precise localization is difficult. Cardiovascular findings may also be seen in the extremities. You have to take note of the temperature and color of the extremities. Like, for example, in patients with peripheral arterial occlusive disease where you find cool extremities or the presence of clubbing, arachnodactyly or long fingers and pertinent nail findings can be surmised quickly during this examination. Clubbing implies the presence of central right to left shunting as previously mentioned although it has also been described in patients with endocarditis. Its appearance can range from cyanosis and softening of the root of the nail bed to the classic loss of the normal angle between the base of the nail and the skin or the diamond shape when you do the examination of when you look for clubbing. 
to the skeletal and periosteal bony changes of hypertrophic osteoarthropathy, which is seen rarely in patients with advanced lung or liver diseases.
occult orum syndrome is uh, characterized by skeletal abnormalities of the arms and the hands, plus a heart defect. It is usually associated with atrial septal defect as seen on your left and an opposed fingerized thumb as seen at the top portion of the slide. And the woman is an example of an old forum syndrome patient. Another disease with skeletal manifestation is Marfan syndrome. It presents with arachnodactyly or your spider fingers. These are abnormally long and slender type of fingers. And you do an examination like the wrist sign, that is you do overlapping of the thumb and fifth finger around the wrist. A positive thumb sign or protrusion of the thumb between the ulnar aspect of the hand and the fingers are clenched over the thumb in a fist sign. You can see this in the lower portion of the slide. And the arachnodactyly is seen on the figure or in the photo at the top part of the slide. Marfan syndrome are usually associated with MVP or mitral valve prolapse and aortic aneurysm. A mnemonic to this is Marfan, MAR, MVP, aneurysm. Please look at the slide for you. Endocarditis lesions can also be seen on the extremities. The Janeway lesions of endocarditis is hard non tender, slightly raised hemorrhages on the palms and soles, as seen in the figure, whereas the Osler nodes, these are tender raised nodules on the pads of the fingers or toes. Splinter hemorrhages are classically identified as linear petechiae in the mid position of the nail bed and should be distinguished from the more common traumatic petechiae, which are seen closer to the distal edge. Lower extremity or pre saffron edema in the setting of an elevated AVP defines volume overload. It may be a feature of chronic heart failure or constrictive pericarditis. I'm sure you know how to get the JVP, as seen in the figure at the top. The figure on the second or the photo on the second part is pre-cycle edema. Not all peeping edema is caused by heart failure or other systemic diseases. It can also be seen in patients who use dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. An example is amlodipine. In patients who have muscular atrophy or the absence of air along an extremity, is consistent with severe arterial insufficiency or a primary neuromuscular disorder. For deep venous thrombosis, a test like your Homan sign, you know, that is posterior calf pain on active dorsiflexion of the foot against resistance is neither specific nor sensitive for this disease. Now we go to the cardiovascular examination proper. First is we examine the JVP or the jugular venous pressure and also the waveforms. Your JVP is the single most important bedside measurement from which to estimate the volume status of your patient. We have to identify first where is our external jugular vein and where is our internal jugular vein. So in the photos, you will see where the location of the IJ vein and where the location of the external jugular vein based on the 
sternocleidomastoid muscle. The internal jugular vein is preferred because the external jugular vein is, is valved and not directly in line with the superior vena cava and right atrium. However, the external jugular vein has been used to discriminate between high and low central venous pressure. We usually use the IJ vein when we put access for patients who will undergo hemodialysis. So we put a catheter at the internal jugular vein and use it for hemodialysis purposes. From your first year and to the second year and up to now, third year, you know, we usually still you know, teach you how to get the JVP. Okay, so this is this is the photos shown to you. This is how you measure your JVP. So the venous pressure or the vertical distance between the top of the jugular venous pulsation and the sternal inflection point or the angle of Louis with a distance of more than 4.5 centimeter at 30 degree elevation is considered abnormal. The jugular venous waveforms uh, are really difficult to distinguish from colored pulsation. However, each has a, a distinct characteristic. So for A, though it stands for atrial contraction, X corresponds to atrial relaxation with the X. C, this is closure of the tricuspid valve. That is, there will be bulging of the tricuspid valve with ventricular contraction. And V, feeling, so parang V, feeling of RA, so the blood from the vena cava fills up the right atrium. Y is atrial emptying. So there is a Y in the emptying. So with opening of the tricuspid valve. So these waves, A, X, B, Y, and C, now this makes up the jugular venous pulse waves. Please take note of the uh, figure on your Right side. Please memorize. We will discuss them one by one. So we'll start off with the A wave. So the A wave reflects right atrial pre-systolic contraction and it occurs just after the electrocardiographic P wave preceding the first heart sound. A prominent A wave is seen in patients with reduced right ventricular compliance. A canon A wave may occur with atrial ventricular dissociation and right atrial contraction against a closed tricuspid valve. In a patient with right complex tachycardia, the appreciation of canon A waves in the jugular venous waveform identifies the rhythm as ventricular in origin. Of course, definitely, A wave is not present in atrial fibrillation. This video shows to us a prominent A wave in pulmonary hypertension. Please take note of the tall A wave in the diagram. After the A wave is the X descent. So after atrial contraction, there will now be a release of blood to the right ventricle. So when there is 
uh, relaxation now of the atrium. There will now backflow of blood from the uh, jugular vein going back to the right atrium. So there will now be a decrease in the pressure. And at the same time, blood flows into the right ventricle. And this causes the pressure to go down, creating the um, X descent. What about the C wave? The C wave happens when there is already closure of the tricuspid valve and there is start of right ventricular contraction. So when the right ventricular contracts, there will now be an, an increase in the pressure and pulls and pushes the tricuspid valve to the right atrium. And this bulge now will create pressure going to the jugular vein. So there will now be a, an increase in the uh, pressure in the right atrium. Next is V wave. It represents atrial feeling, or this is also called atrial diastole. This occurs during ventricular systole. The height of the V wave is determined by right atrial compliance. So here, the volume of blood returning to the right atrium either antegrade from the vena cava or retrograde through an incompetent tricuspid valve. Since we now know the physiology of the V wave, in tricuspid regurgitation, the V wave is now accentuated. The subsequent fall in pressure or the Y descent will become rapid. With progressive degrees of TR, mild to severe, the V wave merges with the C wave, now called the CV wave. Now, the right atrial and jugular vein waveforms become ventricularized. You can see here in the pressure graph that the, from the normal up to the mild, so you can see here the increase in the V wave, okay, up to the time the patient becomes, has now a CV wave at the severe tricuspid regurgitation. This is an example of a giant CV wave of severe tricuspid regurgitation. Cosmo sign. This is defined by either a rise or a lack of fall of the JVP with inspiration. This can be seen in, in, in patients who have constrictive pericarditis, restrictive cardiomyopathy, massive pulmonary embolism, right ventricular infarction, advanced left ventricular systolic heart failure, which affects the right ventricle already. Normally, the venous pressure should fall by at least three millimeters with inspiration. So please take a look at the video for recognition of cosmos sign. And lastly, is the Y descent. Y descent happens when the blood flows from the right atrium to the right ventricle. So the pressure in the jugular vein decreases. Y descent can become prolonged or blunted with obstruction to right ventricular inflow as may occur with tricuspid stenosis or in patients who have pericardial tamponade. Okay, let us now differentiate the two types of pulsations in the neck area. So we have the internal jugular pulsations and carotid pulsations. For the internal jugular pulsation, it's usually rarely palpable. However, of course, the carotid pulse is very strong, so it is palpable. For the internal jugular pulsation, it is usually soft, 
rapid, undulating quality, usually with two elevations and two throws per heartbeat, while carotid pulsation has a more vigorous thrust with a single outward component. Pulsations of the IJ pulse of the internal jugular vein are eliminated by light pressure on the vein just above the sternal end of the clavicle, while the carotid pulsation cannot be eliminated by this pressure. For the IJ pulsation, the level of the pulsation changes with position dropping as the patient becomes more upright. In the carotid pulsation, the level of the pulsations unchanged by position. Again, for the IJ pulsation, the level of the pulsations usually descends with inspiration, while carotid pulsations, the level does not, is not affected by inspiration. So this is the difference between the two types of pulsations. If you want to accentuate the JVP, you can apply a technique called the abdominal jugular reflex. This is elicited with firm and consistent pressure over the upper portion of the abdomen, preferably over the right upper quadrant for at least 10 seconds. That's why it is also called the hepatojugular reflex. A positive response would be a sustained rise of more than three centimeters in the JVP for at least 15 seconds after release of the hand. This can be seen in patients who have a high PC, a pulmonary artery wedge pressure of more than 15 millimeters mercury, especially in patients who have heart failure. A persistently elevated JVP, especially in patients who have heart failure, it is a marker of poor prognosis, meaning the patient may have a high incidence of hospitalization and high incidence of mortality. We will now review how we get the blood pressure. Act measurement depends on number one, body position, the arm size, time of measurement, place of measurement, the device that we use, the device size, the technique, and the examiner. Blood pressure is best measured in the seated, relaxed position with the arm at the level of the heart. Using an appropriately sized cuff after a five to 10 minute of relaxation. When it is measured in the supine position, the arm should be raised to bring it to the level of the mid right atrium. When taking the blood pressure, we have to know the size of the cuff that we will be using and also the size of the arm of the patient. The length and width of the blood pressure cuff blood length should be 80% and 40% of the arm circumference respectively, as shown in the figure. Now these are the common sources of error in practice. If you use an inappropriate small cuff, this will result in marked overestimation of true blood pressure. But if you use an inappropriately large cuff, this will result in underestimation of true blood pressure. So the mnemonics for this is solution, small, overestimate, and for loop, large, underestimate. Take a look at also at the table where you can, what you, uh, cuff are you going to use? 
or give for the insight. When taking the blood pressure for the first time, you have to know the baseline. So in order to get the baseline for these patients, you may use your palpatory blood pressure monitoring. So I'm sure you were taught in your first year and second year how to get a palpatory blood pressure. So when you do your auscultatory blood pressure, you add 30 millimeters mercury above the expected systolic pressure. And the pressure now is released at a rate of 2 to 3 millimeters mercury. Systolic and diastolic pressures are then defined by the first and the fifth of the sounds respectively. Blood pressure is best assessed the brachial artery level, though it can be measured at the radial, the pedal, or pedal pulse level. In general, systolic pressure increases and the systolic pressure decreases when measured in more distal arteries. Blood pressure should be measured in both arms and the difference should be less than 10 millimeters mercury. Higher BP on the right is due to the streaming of jet straight up along the ascending aorta towards the brachiocephalic artery. Now a blood pressure differential that exceeds this threshold may be associated with atherosclerotic or inflammatory Subclavian artery disease, a supravalvular aortic stenosis, aortic coarctation, or aortic dissection. So you can see the figure on the lower part of the slide. The reason why the right side, the right of blood pressure, is higher than the left side. Systolic leg pressures are usually as much as 20 millimeters mercury higher than the systolic arm pressures. Greater leg arm pressure differences may be caused by chronic severe aortic regurgitation, extensive, and calcified lower extremity peripheral arterial disease. The ankle brachial index can be measured by using your blood pressure. The lower pressure in the dorsalis pedis or posterior tibial artery is divided by the higher of the two brachial artery pressures. This is a powerful predictor of long-term cardiovascular mortality. The blood pressure measured in an office or a hospital setting may not accurately reflect the pressure in other venues. That's why we have what we call a white coat hypertension or a mask hypertension. White coat hypertension is defined as at least three separate clinic based blood pressure of more than 140 over 90, or at least two non-clinic-based measurements of less than 140 over 90 millimeters in the absence of any evidence of target organ damage. This usually does not benefit from drug therapy. However, we must uh, continually monitor these patients because they have the tendency to, be, to develop sustained hypertension later on. So what we do is we monitor them every six months. So we usually request for an OBP monitoring or an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. We must also uh, identify or define 
what a mass hypertension is. Mass hypertension occurs when a patient comes to your office and you get a blood pressure of less than 140 over 90 in a seemingly very high risk individual, meaning is um, has CAD, has diabetes, or has a history of uh, peripheral arterial disease, or uh, any cardiovascular diseases, and the blood pressure is normal at your clinic. But when you get the blood pressure at home, the BP is very high. So these people are very high risk individuals and must be identified immediately. Orthostatic hypotension is defined as a fall in systolic pressure of more than 20 millimeters mercury or in diastolic blood pressure of more than 10 millimeters mercury in response to assumption of, up, of the upright posture from a supine position within three minutes. This usually is accompanied by tachycardia. A common cause of postural hypotension or a common side effect of postural hypotension is syncope and lightheadedness. This is usually exacerbated in the advanced age people, in dehydration, in certain medications, food deconditioning, and ambient temperature. Let's go to the arterial pulses. The carotid artery pulse occurs just after the ascending aortic pulse. Aortic pulse is best appreciated in the epigastrium, just above the level of the umbilicus. The following are the peripheral arterial pulses, subclavian, brachial, radial, ulnar, femoral, popliteal, dorsalis pedis, and posterior tibial. In patients in whom the diagnosis of either temporal arteritis or polymyalgia rheumatica is suspected, the temporal arteries also should be examined, although this is also included in the examination of the head. Please take note of the figure below the slide. It shows to us the location of the bipedal pulses. Although one of the two pedal pulses may not be palpable in up to 10% of normal subjects, the pair should be symmetric. When examining the pulses, one should examine for their symmetry, volume, timing, contour, amplitude, and duration. Simultaneous auscultation of the heart can help identify a delay in the arrival of an arterial pulse. We usually palpate them symmetrically at the same time. When examining for the carotid pulses, the carotid upstroke should never be examined simultaneously or before listening for a brewing. Light pressure should always be used to avoid precipitation of carotid hypersensitivity syndrome and syncope in a susceptible elderly individual. The character and contour of the arterial pulse depend on the stroke volume, ejection velocity, vascular compliance, and systemic vascular resistance. This is best appreciated at the carotid level. Please take note of the figure at the lower part of the slide where you see a dichrotic match. Normally, it should be predominantly monophasic. The following slides will show to you abnormalities of arterial pulses. Please take note of the diagram 
a normal diagram or arterial pulse and versus the abnormal pulse. First is a weak and delayed pulse, pulsus parvus et tardus, which defines severe aortic stenosis. For severe aortic regurgitation, the carotid upstroke has a sharp rise and rapid fall off, also known as your corrigans or water hammer pulse. Some patients with advanced aortic regurgitation may have a bifid or bisperience pulse in which two systolic tips can be appreciated. A bifid pulse is described in patients with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. It is easily appreciated in patients on intra-aortic balloon counterpulsation or IABP in whom the second pulse is diastolic in timing. This can also be seen in patients with sepsis. Please take note of this next finding, pulsus paradoxus. This is a fall in the systolic blood pressure of more than 10 millimeters mercury with inspiration. This can be seen in patients with pericardial tamponade, massive pulmonary embolism, hemorrhagic shock, severe obstructive lung disease, and tension pneumothorax. Please watch the video. The next is pulsus alternance. This is defined by bit-to-bit -bit variability of pulse amplitude, present only when every other phase one corrective sound is audible as the cuff pressure is lowered slowly. This is typically seen in a patient with a regular heart rhythm. It is independent of the respiratory cycle. This can be seen in patients with severe left ventricular systolic heart failure. It should be routine to auscultate for carotid, subclavian, abdominal, aortic, and femoral artery bruis. Please take note that cervical bruy is a weak indicator of the degree of carotid artery stenosis. The absence of this bluey does not exclude the presence of a significant luminal obstruction. Arterial pulses are also important, especially when looking for peripheral arterial occlusive diseases of the lower extremity. The likelihood of significant lower extremity peripheral arterial disease increases with presence of number one, claudication, number two, cool skin, three, abnormalities on pulse examination, and number four, presence of a vascular bruit. We can also use pulse oximetry and looking for peripheral arterial occlusive disease of the lower extremities. A more than 2% difference between the finger and toe oxygen saturation 
will detect lower extremity peripheral arterial disease, comparable in its performance characteristics to the ankle brachial index. Let's now proceed to the inspection and palpation of the heart. The left ventricular apex bead may be visible in the mid-clavicular line at the fifth intercostal space in thin-chested in adults. Visible pulsations anywhere other than this expected location are abnormal. During palpation, we must differentiate a thrill from a heel. A thrill is a palpable heart murmur felt as a shudder under the hand, and this is best felt with distal palm. While the heave is a thrusting sensation, often used to describe large area and amplitude with sustained movement. You may begin your palpation by positioning your patient in a supine position at 30 degree angulation. However, if you have difficulty in palpating for pulses, or thrills, or heaves, then this can be enhanced by placing the patient in the left lateral decubitus position. Once identified, the left ventricular impulse is less than two centimeter in diameter and moves quickly away from the fingers. This is better appreciated at end expiration, with the heart closer to the anterior chest wall. Enlargement of the LV cavity is manifested by a leftward and downward displacement of an enlarged apex lip. When you are able to palpate or S4, which is a palpable pre-systolic impulse, it is indicative of reduced left ventricular compliance and the forceful contribution of atrial contraction to ventricular feeling. While S3, once palpated for the third heart sound, is indicative of a rapidly rapid early feeling wave in patients with heart failure. This may be present even when the gallop itself is not audible. In the following slides, you will be able to appreciate the different heart sounds, normal and abnormal. Ventricular systole is defined by the interval between the first heart sound and the second heart sound, your S1 and your S2. The first heart sound includes the mitral and tricuspid valve closure. For the normal heart sounds, S1 is closure of the mitral valve and tricuspid valve and it is loudest at the apex. Your S2 is closure of the aortic valve and pulmonic valve, which is loudest at the, at the base. This can be usually heard as lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. This slide will show you the intensity of S1 and S2 at the apex and at the base. Please listen carefully.
you may also appreciate split S1, although not common. This can be seen in young patients, those with right bundle branch block, where tricuspid valve closure is relatively delayed. Please look at the figures. The intensity of S1 is determined by the distance over which the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve must travel to return to its annular plane. Its leaflet mobility, the left ventricular contractility, and PR interval. Now, where can we see a loud S1? This is usually seen in the early phases of rheumatic mitral stenosis or in hyperkinetic circulatory states or patients who have short PR intervals. It's shown in the ECG placing the PR interval. What about soft S1? A soft S1 can be seen in the later stages of mitral stenosis, when the leaflets are rigid and calcified, unlike a loud S1 in the first stage of mitral stenosis. This can also be heard in patients after exposure to beta blockers. Patients who have long PR intervals and those with left ventricular contractile dysfunction. Please listen carefully to soft S1 and loud S1. Now we go to the second heart sound. The second heart sound is composed of your aortic and pulmonic valve closure. It has a normal or physiologic speaking. Please take a look at the diagram or the figures in the slide. The next slide will show you a normal or physiologic speaking. Some patients may present with wide physiologic splitting. This can be seen in right bundle branch flap because of the further delay in pulmonic valve closure or in severe mitral regurgitation. This is because of the premature closure of the aortic valve. Again, please look at the diagram. Some disease conditions may present with splitting of S2. Number one, an unusually narrow split or even a singular S2 is a feature of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Another is fixed splitting of S2, which occurs in patients with a secundum type of atrial septal defect. Please take note of the diagram on the slide. You can also sometimes appreciate reverse or a paradoxical splitting. This is a pathologic delay in aortic valve closure and can be seen in the following conditions. Left bundle branch block, right ventricular apical pacing, severe aortic stenosis, HOCOM, and acute myocardial ischemia. Please appreciate the diagram on the slide.
The next three slides will show you the sound of the splitting of S2. Please take note when the patient inspires. The third heart sound. This occurs during the rapid filling phase of ventricular diastole. This can be a normal finding in children, adolescents, and young adults. In older patients, it signifies heart failure. A left-sided S3 is a low pitch sound best heard over the left ventricular apex. A right-sided S3 is usually better heard over the lower left sternal border and becomes louder with inspiration. The fourth heart sound occurs during the atrial filling phase of ventricular diastole. It indicates left ventricular presystolic expansion. This is more common among patients who derive significant benefit from the atrial contribution to ventricular failure. In the following two slides, you will be able to appreciate the sound of the fourth of S4 in Hocom and in aortic stenosis. Definitely, since we are uh, attributing it to the atrial contribution, so this cannot be seen in patients with atrial fibrillation. Please listen to the next two slides for S4. Now let us listen to the different types of injection sounds. It is a high-pitched early systolic sound that corresponds in timing to the upstroke of the carotid pulse. It is associated with congenital bicuspid aortic or pulmonic valve disease. Isolated aortic or pulmonary root dilatation and normal semilunar valves. Please look at the diagram and listen to the next two slides for a sound of a bicuspid aortic stenosis, ejection sound, and a pulmonic stenosis. Bicuspid 
aortic valve becomes softer and then inaudible as the valve calcifies and becomes more rigid. While a pulmonic stenosis moves closer to the first heart sound as the severity of the stenosis increases. It is the only right-sided acoustic event that decreases in intensity with inspiration. For the non-ejection heart sounds, it is related to mitral valve prolapse. Maybe single or multiple may introduce a murmur. This click murmur complex will move away from the first heart sound with maneuvers that increase ventricular preload, such as squatting. On standing, the click and murmur move closer to S1. As seen in the figure, we can see here the behavior of the non ejection click, C, and systolic murmur of MVP. With standing, venous return decreases. The heart becomes smaller and prolapse occurs earlier in systole. The click and murmur move closer to S1. With squatting, venous return increases, causing an increase in left ventricular chamber size. The click and murmur occur later in systole and move away from S1. Please listen carefully to the click sound during standing and squatting. Diastolic sounds. The high-pitched opening snap of mitral stenosis occurs after a very short interval after the second heart sound. The opening snap, OS, of the stenotic mitral valve is a distinct crisp extra sound. It can be emulated saying lap butter, adding an additional syllable to the normal heart's top top. Please listen to the sound. Another heart sound is the pericardial knock. It is high pitch, occurs slightly later than the opening snap, corresponding in timing to the abrupt cessation of ventricular expansion after tricuspid valve opening and to an exaggerated wide descent seen in the jugular venous waveform in patients with constrictive pericarditis. Another sound, which is a tumor flop, is a lower pitch sound that rarely can be heard in patients with atrial metsoma, which is a benign tumor of the heart. Listen very carefully to the pericardial knock, and this is followed by the slide of a tumor flap. Now, 
let's proceed to the cardiac murmurs. Heart murmurs result from audible vibrations that are caused by increased turbulence and are defined by their timing within the cardiac cycle. Please take note of the following. The duration, frequency, configuration, and intensity of the heart murmur is dictated by the magnitude, variability, and duration of the responsible pressure difference between two cardiac chambers, the two ventricles, or the ventricles and their respective great arteries. Please memorize the intensity of heart murmur. It is graded into one to six. Grade one is barely audible. Grade two is audible but soft. Grade three is easily audible. Grade four, it is easily audible and associated with a thrill. Grade five, easily audible associated with the thrill and still heard with the stethoscope only lightly on the, on the chest. And grade six over six is easily audible, associated with the thrill and still heard with the stethoscope off of the chest. Now for the timing of murmurs, we must know if it is a systolic murmur or a diastolic murmur. If it is systolic, we're talking about ventricular pumping. And if it is diastolic murmur, we're talking about ventricular healing. Systolic murmurs is restricted flow through narrow outflow tract or vessel, or high flow through normal channels. It's usually made systolic. What about regurgitation? A systolic regurgitation or backflow murmur is exemplified by mitral valve and tricuspid valve regurgitation, and it is usually holosystolic. It occurs occasionally early or late systolic. The flow is through intracardiac defect, like in VSD. It is a holosystolic murmur ventricular septal defect. For diastolic murmurs, it's because of a restricted feeling through stenotic atrioventricular valve or disturbed or high volume inflow. It can be mid-diastolic or pre-systolic. Regurgitation through the semilunar valve, so across the aortic and pulmonic valve. It can be early diastolic or holo diastolic. This diagram shows you the semilunar valve and atrioventricular valves during systole and diastole. Please take note of the valves. Systolic murmurs can be early, mid, late, or holosystolic in timing. An example of systolic murmur is severe aortic stenosis. This would include parvus et tardus carotid upstrokes, a late peaking grade 3 or grade air with systolic murmur, a soft A2, a sustained LV apical impulse, and an S4. Please listen to the sound. Aortic stenosis. During inspection, the carotid pulse 
feet is weak and delayed. Again, Argos et Argos. On auscultation, murmur is mid systolic, ends before S2. It is an ejection sound at third right intercostal space. Other causes of systolic murmur would be the mid-systolic heart murmurs. This can be caused by pulmonic valve stenosis with or without an ejection sound, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, increased pulmonary blood flow in patients with a large AST and left to right shunting, accelerated blood flow in the absence of structural heart disease, like fever, thyrotoxicosis, pregnancy, anemia, and normal adolescence. Please listen to the next two slides. First is pulmonic stenosis, followed by Hocom murmur. For the late systolic murmurs, this is heard best at the apex. It can indicate a mitral valve prolapse. This may or may not be introduced by a non injection flip. Please listen to the next slide for the murmur of mitral valve prolapse. Holosystolic murmurs. This has a plateau in configuration. It reflects a continuous and wide rate pressure gradient. It is between the left ventricle and left atrium for chronic mitral regurgitation, between the left ventricle and the right ventricle for ventricular septal defect, or between the right ventricle and the right atrium for cuspid regurgitation. So these are the different types of hollow systolic nerves. Mitral regurgitation murmur is best heard over the cardiac apex. The intensity of the murmur increases with maneuvers that increase left ventricular afterload, such as hand grip. The next slide will uh, show you or you will listen to the murmur of mitral regurgitation. For the murmur of a ventricular septal defect, it is holosystolic and loudest at the mid left sternal border where a thrill is usually present. Please listen to the next slide for the sound of the murmur of a VSD. Regurgitation murmur is the loudest at the lower left sternal border. It increases in intensity with inspiration. This is the Carvalho sign. It is accompanied by visible CV waves in the jugular venous waveform and, on occasion, 
by Paul Sotheim and Pato Nagel. I discussed this previously in the uh, jugular venous wave one, tricuspid regurgitation. Now we are through with the systolic murmurs. Let's proceed now to the diastolic murmurs. In contrast to some systolic murmurs, diastolic heart murmurs always signify structural heart disease, aortic regurgitation, pulmonic regurgitation, and mitral stenosis. The usual causes of diastolic murmurs are semilunar valve incompetence or atrioventricular valve obstruction. Acute aortic regurgitation murmur is relatively soft and of short duration. Rapid rise in left ventricular diastolic pressure and the progressive diminution of the aortic left ventricular diastolic pressure gradient. In contrast to chronic severe aortic regurgitation, it is classically heard as a, a decrescendo blowing diastolic murmur along the left sternal border in patients with primary valve pathology, along the right sternal border in patients with primary aortic pathology, pulse pressure is wide and the arterial pulses are bounding in character. Aortic regurgitation on inspection will give you a bounding Corrigan's pulse. You can also see Mosset sign, which is head bobbing. On auscultation, you can hear a to and fro murmur, a mid systolic murmur in the aortic outflow, and early diastolic murmur, aortic regurgitation. This is Corrigan sign. Please listen to the next slide for aortic regurgitation murmur. The murmur of pulmonic regurgitation is heard along the left sternal border, most commonly due to pulmonary hypertension and enlargement of the annulus of the pulmonic valve. S2 is single and loud and may be palpable. Right ventricular parasternal lift that is indicative of chronic right ventricular pressure overload. Mitral stenosis murmur, this is a classic cause of a mid to late diastolic murmur. This is best heard over the apex in the left lateral decubitus position. Low pitch or rumbling and is introduced by an OS in the early stages of the rheumatic disease process. Please listen to the next slide for its murmur. This picture shows to you a narrowed mitral orifice, a stenotic mitral valve.
when listening at the bass, abnormally loud S1 is heard. There will be shorter S2, OS interval indicates severe mitral stenosis. When listening at the apex, you will hear a crescendo, a systolic murmur, a loud S1, S2, OS, and mid-diastolic murmur. On inspection, you can see the JVP is A-wave dominant. A-wave occurs with loud S1. We can also have functional mitral or tricuspid stenosis. This is the generation of mid-diastolic murmurs that are created by increased and accelerated transvalvular diastolic flow, even in the absence of valvular obstruction. So this can be seen in severe mitral regurgitation, severe tricuspid regurgitation, a large atrial septal defect with left to right shunting. An Austin Flint murmur of chronic severe aortic regurgitation can mimic a mitral stenosis murmur. This is a low pitch, mid to late apical diastolic murmur that sometimes can be confused with mitral stenosis. This is due to the mitral inflow and it is best heard at the apex. This video clip shows to you how severe aortic regurgitation murmur mimics an organic mitral stenosis murmur, or what we call an Austin Flint murmur. These are unusual causes of a mid diastolic murmur. It includes atrial myxoma, a complete heart block and acute rheumatic mitral valvulitis. Now we go to the continuous murmurs. This is predicated on a pressure gradient that persists between two cardiac chambers or blood vessels across systole and diastole. It typically begins in systole envelope the second heart sound, S2, and continue through some portion of diastole. A classic example of continuous murmur is patent ductus arteriosus. It is usually heard in the second or third interspace at a slight distance from the sternal border. Please listen to the sound of big A or patent ductus arteriosus. Other continuous murmurs are ruptured sinus of Valsalva aneurysm with creation of an aortic right atrial or right ventricular fistula, a coronary or great vessel arteriovenous fistula, and an arteriovenous fistula constructed to provide dialysis access. A mammary souffle of pregnancy is also an enhanced arterial blood flow through engorged breasts. The diastolic component of the murmur can be obliterated with firm pressure over the stethoscope. Cardiac murmurs can be attenuated or increase or diminish by some maneuvers or body positions. An example would be inspiration. 
right-sided murmurs generally increase with inspiration and left-sided murmurs usually are louder during expiration. During Valsalva maneuver, most murmurs decrease in length and intensity, except for Hokom, a systolic murmur which usually becomes much louder, and mitral valve prolapse, it becomes longer and often louder. After release of the Valsalva maneuver, right-sided murmurs tend to return to control intensity earlier than do left-sided murmurs earlier into systole. During hand grip maneuver, most murmurs increase with exercise. Murmurs of aortic stenosis or obstructive cardiomyopathy tend to decrease with thick hand grip. With arterial occlusion, wherein a blood pressure cuff inflation to both arms increases peripheral vascular resistance. This augments the murmurs of ventricular septal defects and of mitral and aortic regurgitation. The opposite happens to aortic stenosis. During standing and squatting, squatting and passive leg elevation increases both venous return and peripheral arterial resistance. Standing diminishes most murmurs. Squatting or leg elevation increases most murmurs. Standing intensifies the murmur of Hocom and prolongs mitral prolapse murmur earlier into systole. Squatting and leg elevation have the opposite effects. After a premature ventricular contraction, semilunar stenosis murmurs increase during the beat following a post extrasystolic pause or during beat following long RR interval in atrial fibrillation. However, the mitral regurgitant murmur tend to remain unchanged or even diminish. I would just like to show you in these next two slides the effects of physiologic and pharmacologic interventions on the intensity of heart murmurs and sounds. Please read your books on these two tables. This is my last slide. So this is a summary of what we have all talked about. These are examples of write-up of cardiovascular physical examination findings. The jugular venous pulse, JVP, is 3 cm above the sternal angle with a head of and off bed elevated to 30 degrees. Carotid upstrokes are brisk without bruises. The point of maximal impulse, EMI, is tapping. 7 cm lateral to the mid-sternal line in the fifth intercostal space. As a good S1 in S2, no murmurs or extra hard sounds. Another write-up for cardiovascular PE would be an example. The JVP is 5 cm above the sternal angle with the bed, head of bed elevated to 50 degrees. Carotid upstrokes are brisk. A bluey is heard over the left carotid artery. The point of maximal impulse is diffuse, 3 cm in diameter, palpated at the anterior axillary line in the 5th and 6th intercostal space. Says S1 and S2 are soft, S3 present, 
harsh 2 over 6 holosystolic murmur best heard at the apex, radiating to the lower left sternal border. No S4 or diastolic murmurs heard. So hopefully, you have learned a lot from our lecture of cardiovascular physical examination. See you on your internship and during your residency training. God bless.